stay small, you know, and not say anything and just kind of suck it up and live with it. No, you said, hey, can we have a better world? Can we have a couple microwaves, man? It would be a lot nicer. And I promise you, this planet is not going to get better if you don't stand up and say, you know what? I have a right to speak up. I live in this planet, you know, and I want it changed. And, you know, you may not be 18 and voting, but those government leaders in Washington are still your leaders. You're a citizen of this country. Uh, and these guys are your, they're your hired help. I, that's what I always say, you know. Like these guys draw a government paycheck. They work for you. You have a right to ask them, what are you doing about this? Write me back. I'm concerned about global warming. IPCC report says one meter rise, blah, 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 blah. Uh, I, want, I want you to write me back, and I want you to tell me what you're doing about this. You know, like I would ask them to you know, answer for themselves on these things. Don't be small. Ask, ask politely, but ask these guys uh, what they're going to do about it. Uh, Civic so duty, uh, you're now informed, you know, way more than, like, really, I swear, you know way more now, tonight, than 99.99% of this planet. Uh, people have an inkling, you know, but you've got the full story now in a nice linear fashion. Um, and I always say, the college kids, I say, you have a civic duty. Somebody, you know, what you do too, actually, by the way, somebody built this school um, and uh, allowed you guys to come here and get educated. and. People didn't build universities and they didn't build this school just so you could get a higher paying job. They built schools so that society could be better. Uh, your guys' ideas feed back into making a better society, like putting microwaves in the, in the, in the common room. Uh, your ideas are important and valuable and that's why they build schools and that's why they build high schools and universities. Uh, and you guys should give something back. Uh, this one. You know, how many people have read about some environmental disaster? Like, it's kind of like somebody else's house got burned down or something. You're like, wow, that's awful. Like, you really do have serious, you know, like the poor dolphin or whatever. I don't know, you know. But, but then, like, you close, you turn the page or you turn the web page or you go to another page. And, like, the next day, you completely, like, it's kind of left your thought process. But if, but if it was your pet dolphin, you know, if it was your dog or something, somebody shot your dog. It'd stay, it'd stay with you for quite a while, wouldn't it? Like, you wouldn't let that one go, right? And this ocean is your, half the oxygen made on this planet is made in the, so photosynthesis makes oxygen, right? And photosynthesis in the ocean is half of the total global, uh, and the other half's on land. So they say every other breath you take, you owe, you owe a thank you to the ocean for the photosynthesis that gave you that oxygen. So. The ocean is a, you know, a life support system for planet Earth, and you're part of planet Earth. So, you know, so even though you don't live on the ocean or you don't earn your living from the ocean, that ocean keeps you alive. And therefore, it's yours, just like it's your dog or whatever. And, uh, and if somebody messes with it, and the story I have for this is when the BP oil spill first happened, um, it was like day, the morning of, and there was a, a radio interview, and the guy was saying, well, I don't think there's going to be, and then nobody knew how big it was going to be at this point. I don't think there's going to be a big outcry because it's unlikely that the oil's going to reach shore. And I'm like, what? It doesn't have to reach. It's already reached my ocean. That's the problem, you know? My ocean's already been messed with, you know? It doesn't have to touch somebody's land that's owned by somebody. I, that's my ocean. So, um, so I, you know, this idea that this ocean is yours, and you should, and I say, like, when people are, well, you're keeping us from catching these fish, it's like, Screw you guys, you know, that's as much my fish. You act like you own the world. You act like that's your fish. That's not your fish. It's everybody's fish and it's my fish as much as yours. And I have a right to ask if I want to kept in the, in the ocean, I have a right to ask for that. And if I get enough people behind me, I say it stays in the ocean, you know. So this idea of, oh, I don't know, it's, I'm not a fisherman. It's like, no way, man, that's your stuff. Um, so... One of my favorite ones is, is you know, the loud mouth who says, rah, 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 if I want to put a 200, how many people have heard that loud mouth? If I want to put a 200 watt light bulb in my house, nobody's going to tell me, no government's going to tell me. How many people heard that, right? Right? Well, my answer to that is, again, F you. <laughs> you know, as long as your light bulb is plugged into a power plant that's pumping CO2 into my atmosphere, you have to listen to me, you know? Like, you don't get to just dump stuff in my atmosphere and not, you know, you're connected to me. You want to go off the grid, get solar panels, you could have a 200 watt, you could have a thousand 200 watt light bulbs, I don't care. But as long as you're plugged into my, my space, my CO2 space, you, gotta, you do have to listen to me. I do have a right to tell you to cool it. Um, so anyway, you guys should let, the, this is your stuff, being with your atmosphere, your ocean, and you totally have a right to ask for it. 
These are some, some ways to see Thomas as a way to see what bills are being considered by Congress. Um, the bottom up action, this is a great story. I love this story. This is, I, so thanks, by the way. I had no idea I was going to, I knew it. I didn't know. I swear I didn't. So, <laughs> um, so this bottom up idea. So Cornell, so by the way, this is 2035. Cornell, about five years ago, made a plan that says, we're going to take the campus to zero carbon emissions by 2050. And then the climate scientists at Cornell said, you know, if you want to be a leader and show what we have to do, we don't have that much time. We don't have the 2050. You know, we have to do this a lot faster. We're, it's on our head right now. And so they recognized that. So they said, okay, we're going to try our best to get to zero carbon emissions by 2035. Cornell is very proud of their climate action plan, very proud of their sustainability. It's like all over their web pages. You wouldn't believe it. But it didn't start, just like women's right to vote, African-American civil rights, it didn't start with the president of the university waking up going, wow, man, I think I'm going to get sustainable, man, I'm going to do that, you know? No, it did not happen that way, because I was here at Cornell when this happened, and Cornell students camped in front of Day Hall, the administration bill, they camped in sleeping bags, they preceded by a decade Occupy Wall Street, and they said, you guys have to commit Cornell to the Kyoto Protocol uh, reduction, uh, emission reductions uh, uh, prescribed into protocols, uh, even though our country didn't sign on to that, you need to act like a leader and you need to take the you need to take campus emissions down at the same rate that the Kyoto Protocol is prescribed. And the administration's like, no, oh, fiduciary responsibility, we can't, you know, we have to be in charge of the endowment, make sure it's financially sound, and we're like, we're not moving, man. We're staying in our sleeping bags in front of Day Hall, tell you. So they did that for two or three days. I talked to them in front of Day Hall about climate science stuff. Um, and finally, Day Hall, the president, finally relented and said, okay, okay, so you can read this if you want. So forget the year now, it says, 2001. So these students finally got the administration to commit to Kyoto Protocol reductions. Um, and that started everything, guys. That started everything. That brought us to today, where Cornell has taken the campus to zero carbon emissions. They've exceeded Kyoto by a long ways now. Uh, but that got things going, you know. So. So, and it started this bottom-up thing, so, um, and this is like, go home and tell your parents, Bruce told you to go out and protest in the streets, but I tell you, you know, you don't have to protest, you can write letters to Congress, write letters to the editor of the newspaper, it doesn't have to be uh, a protest in the street, but in 2011, uh, Time Magazine made the protester raise your voice, you know, you're going to have to do it, you don't ask for it, you're not going to get the microwave, that should be the... You know, you guys should all get t-shirts that says, if you don't ask for it, you're not going to get the microwave. You know, put like a tree or something on that. Um, <laughs> really, it would be cool. So anyway, so guys, you know, I, this is when I first got really hopeful about the millennial, millennial generation. So from, from uh, the Arab Spring to Occupy Wall Street to Malala Yousafzai, you know, all of these guys, she's your age, man. She's your age, and she got a Nobel Prize, you know? So you guys are not too young to make a big difference, I'm telling you. Um, and none of these guys, her included, you know, knew exactly where things were going to go. When they said no, but they all said, what we have today is definitely not working, you know? So the guys in Egypt said, you know, we had this dictator that's killing people, you know? And my parents and my other parents put up with this, but it stops with us. Uh, they've got a long ways to go, I admit that. Um, and we still have a long ways to go in Afghanistan for Afghanistan with education for, for girls. Uh, but they've moved it off that bad, stable point. And my hope is, is that you know, this youth generation, these guys all got dealt a raw deal in their countries. Um, and uh, my hope is that the global youth generation, you guys got dealt a raw deal, man. You got dealt a planet that's completely screwed up by us. Um, and my hope is that your generation is the one that says no more, you know, it, it ends with us. Um, and you push us off this point. Um, and so I encourage, you know, like when I was, when I talked about, you know, at Cornell about how many millennials have heard, you know, all the students, that millennials are selfish and self centered almost all of them rose their, raised their hand. And when I said, my generation has no right, you know, um, in a more strong way than that. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, you know, I had several emails going, you know, to me the next day going, you know, you're right. Like, I was, I was told, like, that's what I was, but, you know, you're right, I'm not, you know. And, you know, if everybody keeps telling you guys you're worthless and you're not, you're selfish, then you're not going to, you're not going to rise up and be powerful. And so I encourage, you know, anybody that tells you that, basically say, fuck 
you. <laughs> uh, sorry, but you know, I can't really, you know. So anyway, these are uh, these are examples. Uh, I went with these guys to these protests. These are Cornell students and Ithaca College students. We went to the ex and they organized everything. They just asked me, you know, do you want to come down with us? And I just came down. So they did all the work. I didn't I didn't organize the thing. It wasn't me, it was it was the student driven. They they figured out how to charter the buses. Uh, they got the buses, two buses down here, and three or four buses to New York City. Uh, we circled the White House and asked President Obama to keep his word and not let the XL pipeline go through. Um, here's the White House in the background. And I made the Time magazine, but I wanted to sort of make the analogy of uh, these are real Time magazine uh, uh, photos, and I wanted to make the analogy that someday I want to see some of the Cornell students and some of you guys on the cover of Time magazine. Sorry for the thing. And then, um, Finally, I've already mentioned this, that you know, we can't scare you into a better future. And the analogy is Martin Luther King Jr.'s famous speech uh, is not, I have a nightmare, it's I have a dream. And you know, we don't have to run away from a scary world. We can be drawn to a, and I love this article, but it gets back to this idea. Uh, so this is like all these great things, energy independence, you know, clean air. Uh, and, and a really quite a beautiful world, you know. Um, and this guy's like, well, what if it was all a hoax, you know, and there was no global warming? It's like, we, it doesn't matter. We're going to have a beautiful world. So, again, it comes back to this idea that in 100 years, we're going to look back and we're going to look so primitive using fossil carbon energy and all this shit and all the pollution and all the oil spills and all the fires and all the people killed in the fires and all of the air pollution that kills people through asthma and everything else. We are just going to get what were they thinking, those people? So I think the future is, is going to be pretty awesome for you guys. And uh, I think that we need to just keep pressure on our leaders to get them to change and to follow the plan. Every problem we have, there's a technical solution. We need these guys to follow the plan. Thank you. Um, last thing, I have a uh, Cornell Oceanography uh, Facebook page. Uh, and if you, if you like it, you'll get about three or four or five uh, news feed, you know, articles a day. I have, you know, I push over things that are ocean conservation related, global warming related. If you're into Facebook, then go do that. Okay, I'm done. Bye. <laughs>